this lecture, I want to go through um, the molecular orbital diagrams for the allyl system. Um, I just realized I don't have my notes in front of me. Sorry. Okay. So um, the molecular orbital diagram for allyl systems. This um, speaks to kind of uh, something that's a bit unusual about um, molecular orbital diagrams of pi systems, and that is what if you have three atoms present? Um, so these are four allyl systems. And what we can do is we can, we can actually describe the molecular or provide a molecular orbital diagram for allyl radicals, allyl cations and allyl anions. Now, one thing I didn't mention earlier, but may be helpful for some, I like to focus on the vertical node count, but um, there's going to be something that emerges in terms of orbital symmetry in this lecture that you might find useful. So let's look at the allyl systems that we're talking about. So allyl radicals are going to be double bond next to a radical, allyl cations are double bond next to a carbocation, and allyl anions are double bond next to an anion. Okay, so if we look at this system, it's a bit unusual because this does represent a conjugated pi system, but it doesn't have you know, it only has three atoms. So allyl, radicals, cations, and anions are conjugated pi systems. With an odd number of atoms, an odd number of atoms, and that is specifically three. So if we have carbon, 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 these three carbons represent the three atoms of our pi system, as long as this is a dot, a plus charge, or a negative charge. Why? It has to be a dot, a plus charge, or negative charge, a radical, a cation, or an anion. If it's not, then it's probably not something that's in conjugation. So if we took the exact same system and attached it to a CR3 group, this does not count. This is just ethene. We need to have the radical, the cation, and the anion because all three of these can participate in resonance. So they are in resonance or delocalized with the pi bond. So they count is my point. They count even though they're not a double bond, even though we're not going double, single, double, we're going double, single electrons or the absence of electrons. Okay, so we can draw resonance structures of these things. My point is we count the three atoms. So our pi molecular orbital diagram has has three atoms. Okay, if it has three atoms, then we have three molecular orbitals that are shaped with three p atomic orbitals. So we took the three p atomic orbitals in each of those three atoms of our allyl system, and we added them together to make three molecular orbitals, each composed of three p atomic orbitals. Okay, so we have, we know how many molecular orbitals we have, we know how many p orbitals we have to use to make those molecular orbitals. The other thing we want to know is how many electrons will we have in our system? We have these, this molecular orbital diagram has two, three, or four pi electrons. Two electrons from the cation, three electrons from the radical, 
or four electrons from the anion. We'll go over this in a little bit when we draw the molecular orbital diagram. What's cool about the allo system is the, the um, arrangement of the molecular orbitals in terms of their energies and their shading that we do is going to be the same whether we have an allo cation radical or um, anion. Okay, now the thing that changes between the cation, the radical, and the anion is going to be the number of electrons that we use to fill up those orbitals, whether that's two for the cation, three for the radical, or four for the anion. We'll look at where those numbers come from um, at the end here. But for now, let's start by drawing the molecular orbital diagram. So we're going to have three orbitals. We're going to have a pi three, a pi two, and a pi one. So I'm sort of counting down from the highest energy molecular orbitals. Now each of these orbitals are going to be filled with, or going to be made from three p atomic orbitals. Now what's cool about this is we have kind of a break line halfway through to show that anything above this is non-bonding, excuse me, anti-bonding, jumping ahead of myself. Anything below this is bonding, and anything along the line is non-bonding. Okay, so then our node count is going to be, I didn't leave myself much room, but we're going to have zero nodes. Maybe I'll put it under here. Zero nodes, one node, and two nodes. It's always the middle the middle ones that are the most difficult, right? Because the top one, we have to remember that we're all shaded. And, and again, this could be, I just wanna emphasize the shading here just represents opposite phases across the top and the bottom of our P orbitals. The shading could be any color. We could have red and green for the two lobes if we wanted to, we could have pluses and minuses, but there's no sign convention or there's no charge convention. There's a sign convention in mathematics, but not a charge convention. They're just opposites of each other. Okay, I choose white and black because I assume most of you all are using pencils or pens, that sort of thing. Okay, anyway, um, so <clears throat> we've shaded pi one so that it has zero nodes by shading across the top. And we could do the same, we can have the same idea for pi three, except we're going to alternate at every stage. That's going to provide our two nodes, which I show in red, slicing through, and we have zero nodes slicing through the uh, vertical nodes slicing through pi one. Okay, now what about pi two? How do we fit the node, the one node for pi two, keeping in mind that we want to maintain some sort of node symmetry? I can't just do a node here or a node here like one of those. I can't just do one of them because I have to maintain symmetry. Well, it turns out that the answer is we need to slice right through the middle of this P orbital. Okay. And what that's going to look like is we're going to go here and here. Now let's do a better view of pi two down below. This is kind of, this is not great. I'm gonna put like a, an X here. We could do a better or a better um, depiction of pi two. So let's draw pi two again. So some, some notes about pi two. Pi two has one node in the middle of the MO and this is where a p orbital would be if it were one of the other orbitals. So this is where it would usually be. It's not for pi two. Pi two actually shouldn't have a p orbital represented in the middle of the molecular orbital. Instead, a better pi two looks like this. A better pi two for the allyl system, instead of having a p orbital has a dot there to tell us that that p orbital cannot be used because we have to form a node right through the middle.
mathematically what this says is it says that for this molecular orbital there is a zero percent chance that we will find electrons at this point and so let's not even draw an orbital because an orbital suggests that we could have electron density existing within the middle we can't we have to have a node there to maintain symmetry about the orbital now speaking of symmetry something kind of emerges with the energy diagram of the allyl system so let's go ahead and just kind of redraw this okay and i'm going to make note here we've got one node so let's redraw this something emerges that's actually applicable to all molecular orbital diagrams and that is as we go from pi one to pi two to pi three and we consider the shading i'm just going to draw a dot in the center of pi two and we consider the shading we go shade 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 up shade down one node up down up two nodes is that we go from an orbital that is perfectly symmetric to one that is perfectly anti-symmetric. That is, it has opposite symmetry from left to right. That's different from the bottom one. The bottom one has bilateral symmetry. The left and the right sides are equal. Here, the left and the right sides in pi two are anti-symmetric or opposite, okay? They're different. So, I mean, they're, they're different from the bottom case. The symmetry is different, but it's still somewhat symmetrical. Like you could kind of flip it this way and get to something. So we say it's anti-symmetric. The top one now is symmetric. If you look at your notes at the other molecular orbitals we've, uh, diagrams we've drawn for pi systems, what you'll notice is that it's actually the case that we always alternate from symmetric to anti-symmetric to symmetric again. That might be helpful for some of the, um, some of the uh, like pi four and pi five systems of hexatrine, which we need to understand for um, our, uh, excuse me, uh, blank on it, for, for our electrocyclization reactions. If you want to recall those from your head, you know, you don't, you don't memorize all the dots. What you do instead is you think about these rules, like we increase nodes from zero, one, two, three, four, um, up to five in the case of hexatrine. And then you can kind of get about two thirds of the way through just with that. But then remembering uh, pi four and pi five, pi four being critical because it's the LUMO, um, you could recall whether or not it should be anti-symmetric or symmetric. I believe in that case, it's uh, anti-symmetric. You start symmetric, anti-symmetric, symmetric, pi four, anti-symmetric. Okay, anyway, now let's fill electrons. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make three lines and these are going to be occupancies for each of these systems we wanna consider where we have the, um, let's start with the cation the radical and the anion. Now, what do these each look like? Well, for the cation, we have a positive charge. For the radical, we have a single dot. And then for the anion, we have a negative charge. The negative charge comes from a lone pair of electrons on the rightmost carbon atom in this resonance depiction of our allyl system. So we have two electrons in the case of the cation. The two electrons only come from the pi bond. We have three electrons in the case of the radical. Now, why three? Well, we have the one dot plus the two pi electrons. And we have four electrons in the case of the anion. Um, two electrons from the two dots and then two electrons from the pi bond. Pi bond always gives two and then you count however many dots you have left. That's just going to affect how many electrons we can fill our system. Now we always start with pi one. So for the cation, we're going to put two electrons into the lowest energy orbital pi one. For the radical, we need to have one electron go up to pi two after filling pi one with the first two electrons. The anion, we have two electrons in pi one and then two electrons in pi two. That gets us to the four electrons that we have in the allyl pi system. Okay, remember we're ignoring the sigma bonds. We're only looking at the pi bonds here. So using a few mnemonics, we can actually 
describe the allocation, the radical, and the um, anion all with the same molecular orbital diagram just by filling with different numbers of electrons. And that's because the atoms that make up this conjugated pi system are all the same. Now, what does this mean for the bond order? So what's the bond order of the allyl cation? And when I'm talking about bond order, I'm talking about of the pi system, of the conjugated pi system. The allyl cation, its pi bond order is equal to two minus zero divided by two. Why two? Well, pi two is um, non-bonding, pi one is bonding, and pi three is anti-bonding. So when we put two electrons into pi one, we count those two towards bonding. We take two minus zero divided by two, that's equal to one. So it has one pi bond in its conjugated pi system. What about the allyl radical? Well, it turns out the math is the same for all of these. The allyl radical and the allyl anion all have a pi bond order of one. Two minus zero divided by two is equal to one. Pi bond, I'll actually write order as opposed to bonder, sorry. is equal to two minus zero divided by two, which equals one. So they have one pi bond, one pi bond. Okay, so we have pictures of the cation, the radical, and the anion at the top of the screen. So what I'm saying is, is in terms of pi bonds, there's one pi bond, there's one double bond. What are we doing with these diagrams then? What else can we try to understand? Well, we can actually understand that the allyl radical has one pi bond and one electron in a non-bonding orbital. What's the electron in the non-bonding orbital? Well, that's the extra electron, that's the radical. This one electron is the radical. Now I know we have a picture for this, but imagine a really complicated pi system where you're plugging in electrons into the molecular orbitals. You could bring back, if you, if you have electrons in the non-bonding orbitals and they're an odd number, you start to understand that you have a radical present. Now for the anion, we have um, two electrons in a non-bonding orbital. What does it mean to have two electrons in a non-bonding orbital? If you have two electrons that are not participating in bonding, we say that they are lone pairs. But what's key is that the lone pair and the radical are part of the pi system, which tells us that they are in resonance with the double bond. Because if you're part of the conjugated pi system, you can be included in resonance because the non-bonding radical and lone pair are part of the pi system because they're part of the pi system the those electrons are in resonance with the double bond. And we see that. We can draw resonance structures for each of these. I mean, the cation is not super relevant to that current argument, but I can draw a resonance structure where I show that all three atoms are involved. I can take the radical and do the exact same thing using fish hook arrows. where I boost the electron over to the left side. And I can take the anion and its lone pairs and do the exact same thing, only I make a bond to a lone pair. Okay. And so molecular orbital allows us to connect into our resonance depictions and is really helpful for more advanced uh, species that are harder to understand. 
But suffice it to say, even if we have an odd number of electrons that are part of the, or excuse me, odd number of bonds that are part of the conjugated pi system, we can incorporate those using some tricks when we draw our molecular orbital diagram. Remember drawing that dot to indicate that that p orbital did not provide dense uh, uh, space for electrons to exist. That maintains symmetric, anti-symmetric, all that stuff, and allows our node count to match up with what we would expect. But those tricks aside, we've described a ton of quantum mechanical properties of molecular systems in terms of where those electrons can exist without really doing much more math than just adding one onto one to make two to tell us how many nodes we have. Okay, well anyway, that'll do it for this addendum to uh, lecture 51, a more advanced look at some molecular orbitals of pi systems. So until next time, I'll see you next time.